All right. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. That's where we're going to be today. Um, And what we're going to be looking at is, what are the characteristics of a healthy, thriving church? And are we that healthy, thriving church? You know, and one of the things as you're making your way there to think about is, this building is not the church. This building, in fact, gets in the way of the church sometimes. Not this particular building, but I just mean church buildings in general sometimes get in the way. We get so comfortable behind these four walls that we never really act like the church because the church should be out there. The church should be helping those who are hurting, those who are hopeless. The church shouldn't be this building. In fact, sometimes I think we get tethered to these buildings. They almost act like an anchor, not as a way of of really promoting um, what the church should be doing. So, you know, as, as we talk about what the church is, it's not this building. It's us and how we share the gospel of Jesus Christ to the dead and dying world. That's the church. Uh, the church is made up of of members. We are the church. Amen? Amen. And so we're going to be looking at five characteristics of the church, and then we're going to be uh, turning it inwardly on, on what our part is or what we're supposed to look like as a member of the church. So Acts chapter 9, verse 31 says, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds now to what your spirit has to speak to us. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You know, to to read a quote um, that just really struck me about what the church is, uh, it, it says, friend, What are you looking for in a church? Good music? A happening atmosphere? A traditional order of service? How about a group of pardoned rebels who God wants to use to display his glory before all the heavenly host because they tell the truth about him and look increasingly just like him, holy, loving, and united? You know, that's the church I want to attend because if we're realistic, That's what we all are. We're pardoned rebels, right? At one point in our life before we became Christians, we were rebelling against God. We are those pardoned rebels. You know, and and really, to me, it's just such a powerful word picture of what the church is supposed to be, pardoned rebels. So if we know that we've been pardoned, you know, against our rebellion earlier in our lives, then why are, how can we just sit here in this room and, you know, not take that good news out to the, to the world? You know, um, when we really see ourselves for what we really are, without Christ, we're nothing, are we? We're just pardoned rebels. It was nothing we did. It was by the grace of God that we're even sitting in these pews. You know, but we don't always act like that, do we? I ran across a Russian proverb um, that says this. It says, the church is near, but the road is icy. The bar is far away, but I'll walk carefully. You know, it's true, though. You know, if you think about it, sometimes um, that's the way it is. It's like, oh, I'm not going to go to church this week. You know, it's going to be 70 degrees and, you know, I don't want to go out there or this is happening or the football game's on or whatever. But, you know, when we have a hobby or something, we'll get up at two o'clock in the morning to go do it and we'll be out there all day or whatever it is and we'll have passion for it. But when it comes to church, we don't have that same kind of passion sometimes, huh? It's like, oh, the road's icy even though the church is near. But boy, you know, that hobby's far away. I'll just walk carefully to it, you know, and it's unfortunate. But we're going to take a look at at exactly what a healthy, thriving church looks like. And to be a healthy, thriving church, it requires that there's healthy, thriving people within the church, because we make up the church. Amen? Amen? So the five areas we're going to look at from our verses today It says, uh, then the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, first of all, they had peace and were edified. That's the second one. 
and walking in the fear of the Lord, that's the third one, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. That's the fifth one. So those are the five areas that we're going to look at. You know, and, and as we see it, the, the first thing it's talking about is peace. You know, because, boy, how many people are searching for peace? If you look at the news and you look at the world that we live in, you go to the grocery store, you know, you see anything but peace, don't you? You know, you look at all the news reports and there's this war and they doing this and there's that going on and this person got killed, whatever the case may be. There's not much peace in what we see in the world, is there? But God's given us certain promises about peace. And let's take a look at them. You know, the first, in Philippians 4, 7, it says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, the kind of peace that God promises us is beyond human comprehension. It's a heavenly resource that he's given to us, that he's imparted to us, um, if we do what? If we keep our hearts and minds um, stayed on, on Christ Jesus. If we're in Jesus and we're following him and we're keeping our eyes on him, we can have that peace. And it's, that's the only way we'll ever have that peace. Because if, if our peace, or if we're drawing our peace from anything other than Jesus Christ, it's not lasting. It, uh, you know, if we're getting our peace from relationships or we're getting our peace from... Uh, you know, money or whatever the case is that we're searching for, that can all be taken away like that. But only the peace that surpasses all understanding that God gives us will last. And it'll guard our hearts. But we have to be in Christ Jesus. It's something that, um, the fact that he's promised us that and he's Im imparted it upon us, it's an amazing thing. So then, you know, as as we continue on in this thought, and I get my notes back in the right order, you know, God's peace that surpasses all that, that natural reasoning and, and experience and logic uh, can only happen through what he's given us. As it says in Psalms 29, 11, it says, the Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. You know, the Lord's speaking about peace to us, his people, that's us. He wants to impart that kind of peace upon us. And if we're going to be the kind of church that God's called us to be, people should be able to walk through these doors and feel that peace within this church and within its members. Amen? And if not, we're doing something wrong. And if we can't get there, we might as well close the doors down and send them somewhere else where there is some peace. I mean, it's, it's part of a healthy, thriving church. And if, you're, if you don't have that kind of peace, then you need to look inwardly. We all do. Because God's promised that his children will have that kind of peace. Uh, you know, or as it says in Psalms 85, 8, it says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. You know, like it said, once again, God will impart that peace upon us. But what happens the moment that we go back to our old ways or to our old folly, as it's saying here? We lose that peace, huh? We don't have that peace. God is not going to let his children be comfortable in sin. He's not going to be, he's not going to allow us to have that kind of peace if we're not walking rightly with him. Why? Because he don't want us to get used to uh, that anything in our lives that isn't pleasing to him. So thank God he pulls that peace away from us. Uh, otherwise, it'd be too easy to get comfortable in, in things we ought not be involved with. But it says, as long as we don't turn back to our folly, we'll have that peace. So God will impart the peace upon us. And it's our responsibility not to turn back to our old ways. And, and, you know, because what happens when we do, when we're living a lifestyle that isn't pleasing to God, that's where the enemy can slip in, isn't it? Where things like depression and anxiety and fear and, and all the worries and all these other things happen. It's when we're not walking rightly with God, when he's not in the center of, uh, of our lives, we'll start experiencing this kind of stuff. But when God's at the sin, um, you know, when we keep our eyes on God, we'll have that peace. Because we're either going to have our eyes fixed on one of two things. We're either going to have the, our eyes fixed on our circumstances, or we're going to have them fixed on God. And when they're fixed on God, our circumstances just kind of vanish away, don't they? 
Because quite honestly, if our God isn't big enough to take care of, we either have big problems or a big God. You can't have it both ways. Which one is it? And that's something, you know, God will give us that peace. But when we turn to, uh, we become carnally minded, as it says in Romans 8, 6, it says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You know, once again, when our mind is stayed on the, those things that are spiritual, those things that are of Christ, then we'll have life and peace. But when our minds are focused on the things of the world, those things that are carnal, what happens? Everything but life and peace happens. You know, like I said, you know, you start the depression and, and the fear and all these things have an opportunity to creep in. But the answer is always Jesus Christ. And putting our focus back on him. You know, Isaiah 26.3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So think about that. You know, our experience, uh, every facet of our life, we need to keep focused on Christ, right? We can't have some of those areas that, oh yeah, God, we'll give you these areas, but we're not going to give you these areas. I'm not ready to give these up because I'll tell you something. I will promise you something that whatever God asks you to give up, he will replace it with something so much better, something so much greater. If he's asking you to give it up, it's for a reason. It's because it's not beneficial to you. You know, um, we sing the song, he's a good, good father, and he only wants the best for you. And, you know, let's be honest, his, uh, his best is much greater than anything we can ever imagine. So, like I said, God blesses us in that way that whatever he asks us to give up or to give to him, he'll give back in, uh, so much greater. Or as it says in 2 Thessalonians 3.16, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. You know, what a wonderful promise that he'll give us that peace and that he himself um, will give us peace in every way. Every part of our lives can be, we can have that peace that surpasses all understanding. Not some of our uh, life, not this piece of it or that piece of it, but every area of our life can have that peace. We can have that peace. Why? Because he promised it. And him being the God of peace will provide it. You know, it's not up to us. It's up to him. He's in control, not us. That's the first thing we have to do is, is give up the steering wheel of our lives, isn't it? We have to give it to him, you know, and, and quit worrying about all these things because God's in control. So that's the first thing, uh, you know, that we can learn about a thriving church is that it's a peaceful. It should be a place of peace. And those who are within the church should have that kind of peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen? Amen. The second one, it says, and we're edified. Uh, you know, edification means to promote growth within someone by teaching, encouragement, and deeds. You know, it's, pro it's produced by what? Love and sound doctrine. And those two always need to go hand in hand. Because I've seen many people who have sound doctrine uh, that are full of hate or who beat you know, beat others up with, with the Bible kind of type of thing, you know, it, it, but no, if, if we're not imparting sound doctrine seasoned with grace and love, there's no point in even imparting it because it's not going to be received. It's going to do more damage than good. It always has to be, um, it always has to have that love and the grace in it or, or it does no good. You know, I've seen guys who are, who, um, Theologically, were correct, but their delivery and, and the way the things they were saying were were um, had no love seasoned with it, and it was more of a repellent than it was an than it was an attractant to the Lord. You know what I mean? I'm sure we all seen examples of it. So we have to make sure that you know um, everything that we do, no matter if it's technically correct or not, it's seasoned with love and grace. And, it, and it, um, that's also another sign of, a, of a, you know, a flourishing church is it's unselfish. The Bible tells us that we ought to esteem others above ourselves. You know, it's self-sacrificial that, that we are the, um, worry more about other people's needs than our own. 
Um, you know, it's important that we understand. And, and with this edification, it involves a lot with our speech, doesn't it? As it says in Romans 14, 19, Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify one another. Another. Once again, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to pursue these things that edify. You know, we're supposed to actively seek out ways we can edify each other. We're supposed to be, um, you know, have that kind of, of peace with us uh, when it comes to regard, in regards to each other. We should be those that, that um, you know, our, our speech is also seasoned with grace and love. Amen. Because the word warns us in Ephesians, it says, chapter 4, verse 29, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but whatever is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. We really need to watch what comes out of our mouth. If it's not going to build up, if it's not going to speak grace into the hearer, then don't say it. There's no need for it. And if, you know, and if what we're saying is done for the wrong reason, then it shouldn't be said at all. There's no point in it. If it's not going to produce love or edification, then it doesn't it has no place in this church. And you know, God gives a he, he's so wonderful. Uh, he gives uh illustrations of this all the time. So, you know, I, I do the announcements, right? And and I do the the Sunday nights. I pick these up and I was going to use it as a as a uh, illustration of the forms that are out there where you can write the thing. So I pick one up, and then the next one had writing on it. So I read it, and I kind of—it's. I'll just put it this way: it's a good thing I've been in ministry a long time and got thick skin, because the sermon suggestion is, "Why is Pastor Kevin allowed in ministry if he's not saved?" That's what it says. So. so <laughs> So, and that's a good question. So that'll be, whoever wrote that can come see me afterwards and we'll have a sermon out back around the corner. So, <laughs> so but, but no, honestly, you know, it's that kind of stuff. That, um, I laugh because I, I have thick skin and it doesn't bother me, but that could destroy somebody, you know? I mean, it really could. And I'm going to assume it was a joke because I think I'm saved. I asked Pastor Steve. He thinks I am. So I think I'm good. But, um, but that, that being said, though, you know, it's that kind of stuff that really we need to be careful about. We really do. And that's that edification, you know, or as it says in James, it says in uh, ch chapter 1, verse 26, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. This one's religious is useful. You know, that's what it's saying. You know, if we can't bridle our tongue, if we're the kind that spouts off all the time, then our religion's useless. Why? Because it ruins our witness, doesn't it? You know, when we speak like, um, you know, the common everyday pagan, if we speak the same way, well, then why would anybody want to know about our religion or our God? There's no difference between them and us, Right? So we have to make sure that, that our speech, like it's talking about here, is seasoned with grace and love, especially when you're writing me sermon suggestions. <laughs> or as Matthew 12, 36 says, But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. That should scare us sometimes. You know, every word we speak, we're going to be, we're going to have to give an account to it. You know, everything that we've said. And so what are the things we're talking about? You know, are they building up or are they tearing down? Are they seasoned with grace and love or are they uh, hateful? You know, and it's, uh, it's easy sometimes to fall in that pattern where, where what we say and what we do uh, is not out of love and it's not out of grace and it's not out of unselfishness for, for the body of Christ, the church here. Amen. Amen. And you know, um, and I can tell you this from God's word, he hates gossipers. He hates gossip. He hates backbiting. And he puts it in, when he talks and he lists those in, in things we ought not to do, he lists them with things like murderers and, uh, you know, adulterers and things like that. 
He takes it, God takes it serious. As it says in Romans chapter 1, verses 29 through 32, it says, Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Think about, let that sink in for a minute. So it's talking about those who are whispers, gossiping, and those who are backbiting. It put in the same list of all these other things that are awfully ugly, that you really wouldn't want to um, be a part of as a Christian, right? But that's how serious God takes this. And you've all heard the, the proverb that says, you know, life and death is in the power of the tongue. You know, it, it can destroy. It really can. And it's something that we really need to watch. But once again, our, our words and our actions should impart grace, God's love, uh, not on others and not to destroy it. As it says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4, it says, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. You know, edification, it's not manipulative. It's, you know, it's unselfish. It should be something that we do to build each other up, something to strengthen us because we're in a battle. We're in a war and we're all here to battle together. It takes each and every one of us. Each and every one of us have a part in it. Each and every one of us here in this church has a ministry in this church. God's not done using any of you. Uh, and I know that because you're still here. If God was done with you, he'd take you home. So as long as you have a pulse, God still wants to use you. And he, there's a reason why he has you here now. And just to kind of finish up this thought, Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech always be with grace seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. That should be our goal. That's what we should strive for as a church body, as individual Christians, that this is the way our speech should be. Not like those outside of these walls, not like those in the park or down the street, but like this, like, uh, like the Colossians were exalted to be, you know, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each other. It's a powerful thing. So that's the second point of, of a healthy, thriving church and a healthy, thriving Christian is that we're, we edify that we are uh, people who are constantly speaking out grace and love. Amen. So as it continues in the second half of the verse, it says, and walking in the fear of the Lord. You know, the fear of the Lord, really, we kind of lose what that word really means, fear of the Lord. You know, fear of the Lord's not what we necessarily think of it as now in, in our modern, modern vernacular. You know, where when I think of fear, I think of, you know, your brakes go out and you're getting ready to go over a 500 foot cliff. That's fear. But really, what fear of the walking in the fear of the Lord, what it's really talking about is having that awe, that reverence, that that just you know understanding who God really is and acting appropriately about it. Does that make sense? Because that's really what uh, if we truly understand who God is, then we are going to have that kind of fear of the Lord. We're going to have that reverence for Him. We're going to um, see the awe, the you know that wonderful nature that he has. So it's important that we get it. And it also, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, it says in Proverbs 1.7. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is where revelation begins. This is where we really get to know who God is and what he wants from us. This is the very beginning. This is the seed of spiritual growth in our lives. So if we're not growing spiritually, if we're not um, moving forward and maturing in our lives, it probably begins here with the fear of the Lord. We're not in God's word the way we should be. We're not going deeper like, like as a church we're uh, talked about doing. So it's an area that we might need to look inwardly at to, to really see if that's why we're not growing or maturing in the Lord. 
Psalm 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. He prays, his praise endures forever. You know, the fear of the Lord, when we really have the proper fear of the Lord, we're going to want to do his commandments. We're going to want to fo uh, follow him. We're going to want to glorify him with our lives because we do understand who he is and what he's done for us. Amen? It, it's, it's just a, uh, an important piece of what it is. You know, it, to have that kind of fear as we do it as a church should bring purity to the church too because we understand who God is. We understand the reverence of God. We ha as a church have that fear and it should provide purity. It should purify the church. You know, in places where... Uh, you know, the church is really being persecuted. One thing that you see is, is you see a greater purity in church. Why? Because everything, they, they don't know if they're going to make it through the church service without getting bombed or, or killed or whatever the case may be or arrested. So everything they do is, I mean, they have to walk in the Lord and trust in Him more so than we do. You know, for us in America especially, you know, we consider it persecution if the air conditioning is, isn't low enough, you know. Where in these other churches, they don't know if they're going to be firebombed. But, but in, the, in that kind of persecution, it also provides purity. And that's the way it should be for us. When we're really walking in the fear of the Lord, um, it'll provide that purity in our lives and, and in the church. Psalms 19.9 says, The fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous together. You know, the fear of the Lord, like I said, it, it should, you know, it's clean. Um, it, should, it should provide purity. It should wipe all the dirt away from us, right? You know, we'll never be sinless, but we should sin less as we understand who the Lord is and get that reverence uh, of who He is in our lives. Um, Proverbs 14, 27 says, The fear of the Lord is a fountain to life, to turn one away from the snares of death. You know, there's so many opportunities in the world that we live in to be snared by the devil, isn't there? There's so many things out there that want to get in our way. But what's it say here? You know, that the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, to turn you away from the, the snares of death. You know, if you keep getting tripped up in your Christian walk, well, there's a way to stop that. Know the Lord. Understand. Get that wisdom that he's talking about. Have the proper fear. And we have a promise right here in Proverbs that God will keep us from that. You know, that he'll keep us from those snares of death. But we, we have a part in it, don't we? He'll do the work, but we also have to, uh, you know, understand the fear of the Lord. You know, and when you see a church that fears the Lord, man, um, it can move mountains, you know, um, in this community, in this state, whatever. You know, when you have just even a few people who's sold out for God and fully following him, you know, in, in the book of Acts, it talks about how, how they turn the world upside down, you know, and, and what, a, what a wonderful thought that is, because I don't know about you, but this world needs to be turned upside down. You know, and that fear should be taught from, and it should be exampled by those of you who are more mature Christians. We should be the examples of what the fear of the Lord is. It should come from us. And those, those who are newer in the faith should be able to see it within us. To, for us to be able to walk in that reverence and that awe of God, you know, begins with us. Not only us teaching up here, but those who are more mature in the Lord. It's something that we should be modeling. Because let's be honest, if, if we as mature Christians can't model what the Christian walk should look like, why would we expect anybody else uh, to walk worthy of the calling? Psalms 34.11 says, Come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. You know, um, it'll cause the church to want to avoid even the appearance of evil, right? We should not be about anything um, that could bring a black eye to God. We shouldn't even be about anything that is anything other than edifying. 
um, that shows the love of Christ. You know, so those things in our lives um, where we might think we have some Christian liberty to do this or that, but if it's going to make somebody stumble or it's not going to put paint God in the, the light that he deserves and the, the reverence that he deserves, then why are we going to participate it as a church or as individuals? I know um, Pastor Troy and Pastor Steve and myself, we spend a lot of time discussing. You know, we have people bringing up a lot of good ideas all the time to us, and, and we'll discuss them and pray about them. But if we don't feel that God's going to be glorified in it or edified in it, or there's a potential to possibly um, give this church or, or God a black eye, we don't go anywhere near it. And sometimes those decisions ain't always easy to, to make or, or uh, to live out for us because we know it's going to cause, you know, uh, we might hurt somebody's feelings or whatever the case may be. But to be honest, you know, God's word tells us let, um, you know, let God be true and every man a liar. So we're more worried about what God's going to think than people or other churches or these other things going on. Because we, wanna, we want to, as a church, to walk in the fear of the Lord, you know? And that's, that's our goal. We, we talk about it all the time. Job 28, 28 says, And to man, he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. You know, once again, it's a two-part process there. If you want to um, depart from evil, you got to have wisdom. You get wisdom from fear of the Lord, right? So before you even know what's evil, or before you can know what's uh, evil, you need to have the wisdom of the Lord to be able to see the difference between what's right and wrong. Because the messages we get in culture and in society are mixed, aren't they? You know, what they say is good, and the things that we should be celebrating and the things that we should be doing are not necessarily edifying to God. So we need to be able to filter that, filter through that with our knowledge and fear of the Lord. And as Proverbs 22, 4 says, by humility and the fear of the Lord and riches and honor our life. You know, if we want prosperity as a church, and I'm not talking financial prosperity, I'm talking spiritual prosperity, then we need to have that reverence. We need to have that fear. We need to be um, do everything that we can to have that kind of purity. But that's a, that's a good thing, though. You know, when we think about it, um, all of these five concepts are building upon each other, right? The first one is, is we can have peace if we have that relationship with the Lord. The second one is we can have that edification. We can have that built up once we have that peace in our lives. Then we can have that, um, you know, we, we can have that walk, we can walk in the fear of the Lord. And then the next one is we can have comfort in, of the Holy Spirit. You know, think about that for a minute. We can have peace and comfort. God's telling us in his word, we can have peace and comfort. And the peace and comfort comes through him, not through anybody else. It doesn't come from any program. It doesn't come from a relationship. It doesn't come out of a pill bottle or, or anything like that. It only comes to, um, from the Lord. And, you know, God's made a down payment for us. He's given us uh, an inheritance. And that inheritance is the Holy Spirit, as it says in Ephesians 114, it says, Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of God? You know, sometimes as churches, we don't emphasize enough the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. And it's unfortunate because God told us that he wasn't going to leave us. You know, Jesus, when, when he was getting ready to go back to heaven, he said, you know, I'm going to give you something much greater. I'm going to give you a uh, helper. As it says in John 14, verses 15 through 18, it says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. You know, we are not left orphans, right? We have the spirit of truth, the comforter. He's there with us, and he wants to saturate us with God's grace. That's the whole point of the Holy Spirit. You know, he's given us, uh, he's given it to us. Once again, he's imparted that upon us. 
So what do we have when we really walk with the Lord? You know, so far we've been promised that we'll have peace, that we'll have, we'll have comfort, and we'll have the awe necessary uh, for the Lord. You know, as it says in Romans 15, verse 13, it says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, a healthy church will, will flow, it will abide and listen to the Holy Spirit. And think about what it's saying here. You know, so far in this one verse, God's promised us what? Peace, he's promised us comfort, and he's promised us hope. Where else can you get that in the world? Or in what other way could you possibly ever get those things? Uh, they're not situational. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. It doesn't matter what else is, is going on in the world. You can have the peace, the comfort, and the hope. Why? Because God's greater than anything in this world. He's in control. And as long as he's in control and he's telling us that he's imparting that upon us, we can, have, we can be uh, rest assured that that is the case, that we can have peace. We can have comfort. We can have hope. What more could we ask for? Amen? Amen? Then the last part of the verse, and it says, In walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. You know, I love this. You know, um, if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, that's when revival happens. When we're walking in, in um, the way that God's called us to walk, when we're going deeper into his word and, and, and we're edifying one another and, and we're showing that unselfish love to a dead and dying community, watch revival happen, I guarantee it. You know, as it says in uh, the, earlier in the book of Acts in chapter 2, verses 40 through 45, it says, and with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them amongst all who had need. I love this. This is a prescription for, for not only church growth, but our personal growth. If you listen to what it's saying here on, on what the early church did, it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. You know, that time where, where we're absorbing God's word and we're receiving it, it's, um, you know, it's life changing and in fellowship, you know, we need those opportunities to be with the, with our brothers and sisters. You know, we refer to this place as a family all the time and it's a time for, uh, you know, us to spend that time in fellowship. Uh, and obviously it's talking about, um, it continued steadfastly in prayer also, because like we've talked about many times, prayer is powerful. And it's, you know, if you want to see change happen in your life, it's going to be through, it's going to begin in prayer. And it says, then the fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. There was nothing special about the apostles. They were given a certain office at that time in the church. But I tell you what, um, those signs and wonders it's talking about apply to this church. It applies to the church. And there's no reason why, uh, we can't see miracles happen on a on a daily, weekly basis of people being saved and repenting and and you know the things that we pray about abortion being stopped and all these different things. There's no reason why they can't happen. Those kind of signs and wonders can't happen here. Can't happen now. Amen. Amen. Acts six seven says, "Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem." And as many of the priests were obedient to the faith. You know, it's not only priests, but we need to be obedient to our faith. If we truly understand who we are in Christ and how God sees us as his children, as his inheritance, as his special treasure, uh, and what he's done for us, I don't know how we cannot live out this verse and spread. Um, you know, it says, then the word of God spread. That's the key. That's where all the power is. 
It's not in anybody's talking ability. It's not in uh, how much knowledge you have. It's not in, um, you know, any church growth program. It's in the Word of God. That's the bottom line to all of it. So, you know, um, it's good to be in a healthy, thriving church. But a healthy, thriving church begins with us. It begins with us doing our part, like I said earlier. And I'm just going to take a moment as we get ready to close, and I'm going to read to you how we as Christians should behave to be a part of that healthy, thriving church. In Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 9, it says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints. Given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coal of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, that's how we're supposed to act. That's how we're supposed to respond to this world. We're not to um, be overcome with, by evil, but we're supposed to overcome evil with good. Why? Because he who is in us is greater than anything in this world. You know, um, we serve a good, good father, like I said earlier. And his good, he's already overcome the world. So why are we living this life from a place of always, it seems like, defeat or setback? When God told us we're more than conquerors, that we, we've already, the war's already been won. We just need to walk in that victory. Uh, And I guarantee you, church, if we do that, you'll see powerful things happening here. Amen? Amen. Well, as as we get ready to close and I get ready to um, pray to close the service, just a couple of things. One, there will be uh, some elders and and pastors up here uh, to pray with you if you have anything. Then Pastor Steve and myself, are going to go in the back and get ready for the baptisms. So um, if you're going to be baptized, if you want to be baptized, you can make your way to the back bathrooms. Uh, Pastor Steve will talk to you and and we'll get ready to do that. And otherwise, we'll close in prayer. Um, We'll have uh, maybe a song play while we're getting ready to do the baptisms. So um, thank you very much. Let's, Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you... Um, you give us the opportunity to, to sit at your feet and just uh, learn, Lord. God, I pray that you would help us as a church and as individuals um, to have that reverence, that fear for you, God. Um, Lord, I pray that you would just help us to grab a hold of that peace and that hope and that comfort that you've imparted upon us, that you've promised us, Lord. God, may we be people who... Um, that the dead and dying world can see something different about. Lord, that they can see that peace and that our light shines through. So God, I pray that you'd uh, bless this time. Lord, as we get ready to uh, baptize, Lord, I thank you for um, just the awesome opportunity it is. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.